Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Community Bible Church. My name is Pat, and I'm the children's leader here. It's good to see a, a couple kids just came in. That makes me happy. Um, we're glad that you're joined us today. Uh, today is the first Sunday of a month, so for today's service, we will be taking communion together. So if you want to grab a, uh, some juice and some bread at home uh, to be ready for that, it's near the end of Steve's message today. Speaking of Steve, he's going to be starting a Christmas series today called Home Alone, like we haven't had enough of that already. But really, I hope that as we are getting ready for Christmas and getting excited, that our hearts will be filled with thanksgiving to God for giving us the greatest gift ever in Jesus. Uh, before we get to announcements, I just ask that you would pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you had a rescue plan for us the whole time and that you decided to show us how much you love us by sending your son. God, help us to focus on you this season and focus on you this morning. I pray that you'd help us to understand what you have for each of us from your word today. Be with Steve as he comes and speak clearly through him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so some exciting announcements that you're going to want to hear about. Number one, coming up in less than a week is our CBC Christmas event called Merry and Bright Drive Night. It's on Saturday, December 12th from 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. And what's it all about? Well, it's a driving scavenger hunt adventure where you'll be going around Stittsville and the surrounding areas looking for all sorts of Christmas-themed attractions, some familiar faces, all to get you ready for the Christmas, to get you filled with Christmas spirit and ready to celebrate Jesus. Uh, there's also going to be opportunities for us as a church family to support community outreaches during this event. Um, we're going to be supporting the Stittsville Food Bank and also Ottawa Inner City Ministries. Sign ups have sign up is open, and in, you can get the link from the church weekly email. It's on Eventbrite, which is the same platform that you would have signed up uh, to come to the in-person church service today for those who are here. Um, it's important that you sign up for a few reasons. Uh, one is so that we can get you the things you need for the event. And two is so we can try to spread people out as, as well as possible. So there's not too many people at the same locations at the same time. Uh, the second announcement is also very exciting, and it's also another way that we can support our community. It's called the Big Christmas Give. Um, we call it this because it's a way that all of us can participate in thinking of some people in our community who could use a blessing this, this Christmas season uh, through a gift card. So these gift cards will be available for pickup during the Merry and Bright event coming up at one of the locations, as well as on Sunday the 13th and the 20th 
after the service from 11 to 12, you can pick them up here at the church. Um, one final announcement for those here at the service at the church. Um, we, just pray, uh, we just ask that you would not sing today, but that we'd praise God uh, either through humming or from our hearts. Uh, we have some Christmas music worship coming up for you now. Enjoy the service. In the bleak midwinter, all creation groans for a world in darkness, frozen like a stone. Light is breaking in a stable for a throne. He shall reign forevermore, forevermore. And he shall reign forevermore, forevermore. Unto us a child is born. King of kings and Lord of lords, he shall reign forevermore, forevermore. If I were a wise man, I would travel far. If I were a shepherd, I would do my part. For as I am, I will give to him my heart. And he shall reign forevermore, forevermore. He shall reign forevermore. Unto us a child is born, King of kings and Lord of lords, and he shall reign forevermore, forevermore. Here within a manger lies the one who made the starry skies, his baby born for sad. Christ the Messiah Into our hopes Into our fears Savior of the world of fears Promise of eternal years Christ the Messiah And He shall reign Forevermore Forevermore Callister family left on their Christmas vacation. Did we miss the flight? No, you just made it. Yeah! They forgot one small thing. Have yourself. I've a terrible feeling. Christmas. Did you lock up? Let yeah. yourself be light. Do we set the timers on the lights? Mm-hmm. What else could we be forgetting? Our troubles will be ours. Kevin! Ah! Home alone. Police in the northern suburbs are on the lookout for a pair of burglars who are calling themselves the Wet Bandits. We know that you're in there. It's Santa Claus and it's Elf. Get off my property. 
is my house. I have to defend it. Where's your mother? My mom's in the car. Where's your father? He's at work. What about your brothers and sisters? I'm an only child. Where do you live? Can't tell you that. Why not? Because you're a stranger. He's a kid. I mean, what can a kid do to us? Kids are stupid. I know I was. You still are, Marv. This is it. Ow! I don't care if I have to get out on your runway and hitchhike. I am going to get home to my son. Off. I'm dressed like a chicken. Gus Polinski, Polka King of the Midwest. If you have to get to Chicago, we'll gladly drive you. Hey, guys. Yesterday, he was just a kid. But tonight, he's a home security system. You guys give up? Oh, yeah, thirsty for more. From John Hughes. You know, I got a feeling this is going to be your best Christmas ever. A family comedy without the family. Home alone. Are you here all alone? I'm eight years old. You think I'd be here alone? I don't think so. Directed by Chris Columbus, coming November 16th. Well, it's been 30 years since that one came out. It's a classic for Christmas time. If you think about Home Alone. I'm starting a new series today called Home Alone, so I thought I'd bring back some memories with that uh, trailer. But this one's a little different. Home Alone, knowing a God who doesn't social distance. In the original movie, Kevin McAllister ended up spending a lot of time uh, at home, alone, defending his house, uh, keeping away the wet bandits. But there was a there was a, a sadness to it, too, to being alone, to his family not being there, and missing Christmas. Somehow, Christmas alone is not a great feeling. And yet, in this COVID era, we're being told about social distancing and, you know, canceling family gatherings and other things, and, and it makes home alone more of a reality in our world. And it's not something that is easy to take. I mean, for some, the, light, the thoughts of not traveling as much over Christmas and seeing all the family, maybe there's some good things to that too. Uh, and, and I found that the whole COVID thing has kind of a mixed bag, doesn't it? I mean, there's things that are good about it and some not so good things. I remember when it first hit, my big frustration was that um, th th that I had a family trip canceled. We had planned to, to travel to see uh, my two boys who are living o over uh, in Hawaii and the plan was to, to go and see them and my and and a week before I was to leave in March everything got cancelled on me so I was not very happy fortunately I just got to do that vacation just recently and we were able to make it happen so that was very excited exciting and I'm back and I'm feeling free this is my first Sunday out of quarantine so it feels good to be back and, and free again, but when we, you know, and, and when we think of COVID, there's, there's certainly been some frustrations, there's been some difficulties, and there's definitely been time alone. Um, I want to talk a little bit about that, because one of the things about our God is that He does not uh, hide God, that we are not alone, that uh, there is a God who is with us. You know, the story starts off, in uh, the Christmas story starts off with a, an interesting verse. It says in Luke chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, In those days, in those days, so this is a historical event back in history. In those days, Caesar Augustus, one of the great Caesars, one of the main rulers, in fact, this was the, the, the peak of Roman power in the world. They were a world-dominating force. And Caesar Augustus was leading that. So in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree or a law, a command, that a, a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. That a, a decree should be taken. Uh, and a census, that a census should be taken. So why would he do that? The speculation is, well, perhaps he did it for a sense of 
pride, wanting to know how many subjects he had in his dominion, in his kingdom, how many people were under him. But maybe it was for taxation purposes also, right? I mean, taxation purposes would be, uh, uh, they wanted to make sure they had accounting of everybody and make sure everybody was paying their taxes to the Roman Empire. So it starts off with this position of the statement of power as we look at this world dominating power. But for the Jew, for the Israelite living in Israel, the underlying feelings that go with this verse are some of feeling forgotten, of feeling abandoned, of feeling alone. Like, where is God? We're under this foreign power. We're paying all these taxes and we're subject to this foreign authority. Where is God? And so they were feeling some of this, this sense of loss and this, this sense of, of forgottenness. I mean, it had been 400 years in between the Old and New Testament where there had been no prophet, there had been no word from God, and they were just waiting. Where is God? They're feeling alone, desiring to be freed. I was, I was quarantined for two weeks and getting antsy. <laughs> I mean, they, they're, for years they're living under the slavery of this foreign power, feeling alone. And where is God? And then an angel broke in with an announcement about a baby. And another one, and another one. And, and, and appearing to uh, Zacharias, and, and Mary, and, and Joseph, saying that there were babies on the way. That the Messiah was on the way. He was coming. And sure enough, after Zacharias saw his baby boy, John, born, and knowing the Messiah, Jesus would soon be born, he said these words, in Luke chapter 1, verse 68. Praise be to the God, or praise be to the Lord, the, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Praise be to the Lord. I mean, he was filled with joy. The end was in sight. Freedom was at hand. And salvation was almost there. The babies were being born. Well, you know, the rest of the story, Jesus was born, not in a palace, and not by some prestigious or rich family, but in a peasant family in an out-of-the-way place called Bethlehem. He grew up in relative obscurity, and then he began a public ministry that was quite powerful. In fact, he became very influential as he spoke, as he healed people, as he loved on people. And then, because of his growing influence, the Jewish religious leaders stirred up and trumped up some charges against him and then had him nailed to a cross where he died, publicly in, in humiliation. But then three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus came out of the tomb, and it changed everything for his followers. A church was born, and people began to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus appeared to the disciples. He appeared to individuals. He appeared to, to up to 500 people at one time. And they were convinced that he was alive. And it changed everything for them. Rodney Stark, a historian, believes that, that around 40 A.D., there was perhaps a, a thousand Christians in the world. That's all, mostly in the land of Israel, within that country. 260 years later, about 300 A.D., the estimates are that now there were between five and six million Christians in the world. And people have wondered, how is that possible? Especially with all the persecution and all the people trying to, to, to destroy this, 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 uh, te this teaching of Jesus and these disciples. They, they put all the disciples except for one to death. I mean, how is it possible? It grew. It's because of the resurrection of Jesus. You know, the one disciple that didn't die... 
he was captured and he was put out on an island called the Isle of Patmos, where he was in exile for quite a few years. I was thinking about him recently, John, as I was thinking home alone, I was thinking there's a good example of someone who, who was alone, placed out on this island, out off of the coast of Ephesus. Um, uh, today would be present day Turkey, an island out in the middle of the Mediterranean. And he was sent there in isolation. I think of the Apostle Paul. Paul was also, uh, he was thrown in prison and spent time alone also. But Paul, it was a little bit, um, a little bit different. He had at least guards around him. He could, he could talk to them. In fact, it says in, in Philippians that the, the gospel started spreading throughout the guards. M maybe that's why they decided not to, you know, throw John in prison because these apostles were just telling everybody about the gospel. So they stick him on an island where he can't tell anybody. He's alone. And think about it. The church is growing exponentially. Thousands of people Millions of people eventually becoming followers of Jesus. And John is all alone. He can't even participate. He can't even celebrate with people. He's all alone on the island. And then Jesus visits him. At first he wasn't sure who it was. Bright light, and glowing, and he saw Jesus in all his glory. It says in, uh, in the first part of Revelation that, that, you know, when we think of Revelation, that we, we, think, of, um, we, we think of it's the revelation because it's the last book in the, in the Bible and it, there's a lot of pr prophecy about end times. And so we tend to think that it's a, a book about the revelation of what thing, what's coming, right? A revelation of the future, a revelation of what's coming. But the truth is, the very first verse tells us it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. What's being revealed is we're seeing Jesus. And yes, there's lots about end times in there too. But we see that he comes back again. At Christmas, it was the first coming. In Revelation, the second. And he is returning. And these are the first words Jesus says in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8. When he appears to John on that island of Patmos where he's all home alone. And this is what he says. He says, I am the Alpha and Ome the Omega. Says the Lord God, who is, who, and who was, and who is to come. The Almighty. The Alpha and Omega. The first letter and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. He's saying, I'm the beginning and the end. Who was, who, who, who is, who was, and who is to come. We think who is, that's present. Who was, that's past. Who is to come is future. What he's saying is that he is the beginning and the end. He's in the, been in the past. He, in fact, he's, he's, he knows the future. It's almost like he's timeless or outside of time. He is the Alpha and Omega who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty, the All-Powerful One, the All-Sufficient One. It's a powerful revelation of Jesus. But the first two words, did you notice them? I am the Alpha and Omega. Those are really significant for John. John wrote that recorded Jesus' words, but he was the one who recorded a lot of other statements that Jesus, where Jesus said, I am. In fact, in his book that he wrote earlier, the book of John, the gospel story of Jesus, he has seven metaphors of th that he records that Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Seven times he records Jesus saying the, this statement, I am. It's a powerful statement. It comes from 
the Old Testament, back in Exodus chapter 3. In Exodus chapter 3, it's the story of Moses, who also is alone out in the desert, out in the wilderness, and, and he sees this burning bush, and he goes to inspect it, and God speaks to him out of the burning bush and says, I want you to go to, uh, back to Egypt, and I want you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses' question, he has a few of them, but one of his questions is, well, who do I tell them has sent me? Like, who, who is it that's telling me to go? What do, I, what do I call you? And God responds and says, I am. Tell them, I am is sending you. I am. I am present. I am, I always exist. I am sufficient. I am, he says, has sent you. That word, when the Greek translators move that into Greek, they use the little words, ego ami, I am. And John uses them over and over again. And he discusses who Jesus is. Actually, there's more I am's in the book, too. There's another significant one. When uh, Jesus is being arrested, Judas comes up and kisses him, indicating that this is the one you're to arrest because the soldiers are there. And as they move towards Jesus, Jesus says to them, he says, who do you say that I am? Or, or no, he says, who, who are you looking for? Wrong question. <laughs> who, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, which is interesting. Most people in those days would go by, you know, Jesus, son of Joseph or whatever they would call him. But, but knowing that Jesus, um, you know, was known as Jesus of Nazareth, I think some people knew that his biological father was in heaven. He wasn't just the son of Joseph, right? Jesus of Nazareth, that's who we're looking for. And Jesus' response is, ego and me. I am he. I'm the one you're looking for. In fact, when John records this, he says that the soldiers actually, when Jesus said those words, I am, the soldiers fell to the ground. Some people have just said out of reverence for the name I am, the Old Testament name of God. But these are Roman soldiers. I'm not sure they would have fallen back because of that. But maybe there were power in the name being spoken. I am. I am the one you're looking for. There's another incident too in uh, John chapter 8 when Jesus was having a debate with the religious leaders and they were questioning where his authority came from and some even said, you, this guy's from Satan himself. And then they get into this discussion about um, Abraham and, and the Jewish uh, leaders are quite proud of their heritage and that J Abraham is our ancestor and our descendant. So they're making a, a big deal about we're sons of Abraham. And, and Jesus jumps in and says, you know, before Abraham was, before Abraham was, I am. And, and when he said that, they, the, the Jewish leader says, picked up stones and were ready to throw them at Jesus. Because they knew what Jesus was claiming, that he was the Son of God. He was the great I am. And it enraged them that Jesus would call himself the Son of God. There's power in those words. When I see those words, I am, let me define it this way. It, it's the immediate presence of God in time and space doesn't matter if it's the past, the God who was, the God of the present, the God of the future. Jesus says, I am, ever present, in any age, in any time, I am present. The immediate presence of God in time. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The immediate presence of God in time and in space. doesn't matter where you go, how far you run doesn't matter if you're on an island out in the middle of the Mediterranean or whether you're in a manger in Bethlehem. It doesn't matter if you're in Jerusalem or in Ottawa or you're home alone. God is there. 
Because the immediate presence of God in time and space means that we have an all-sufficient, all-powerful, almighty God who's present. I am. John recorded it this way. You know, each of the people had their account of how Jesus was born. And, and Matthew and, and Luke had quite a bit to say. John had simplified it, took a very different approach. And this is what he said about Jesus' birth. He said, the Word became flesh. The Word he had already established, the Word was God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He came and he lived among us. He was with us. The Word became flesh, took on flesh and blood, and came and lived among us. And Jesus himself said, where two or three are gathered, there I am in their midst. I'm with you. He said, um, actually the writer of Hebrews said, then fix your eyes on Jesus. In a spiritual way, we, we focus and say, Jesus, I know you're there. I know you're with me. We can talk to him. We can hear from him. Usually through his word when we, we read that. We communicate with him. The word became flesh. He's with us and dwelt among us. One of my favorite old uh, Christmas songs, well, it's back in the 80s, so a little before Home Alone came along, was a song um, called Mary, Did You Know? And there's a line in that song that says, Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb? That sleeping child you're holding is the great I am. That's a powerful line. As we imagine Mary holding that child, that helpless, that vulnerable baby, is the great I am, the great God of Moses. The great God that John saw revealed in Revelation. The one who was in the beginning, who was in the end. In human flesh. That child you're holding is the great I am. Another poem that I read recently. This one was written back in 1954. A little bit old by a guy by the name of John Betjeman. There's eight stanzas, I'm not going to read them all to you, but in the early stanzas of this poem, he's walking around London, England, and he's describing what he sees. He sees all the decorations and the hustle and bustle of everyone getting ready for Christmas. And he describes it, and as he comes to the end of the poem, he looks up and he sees a stained glass window of the manger, the, nat the nativity scene. And this is what he writes. And is it true, this, mo uh, this most tremendous tale of all, Seen in a stained glass window's hue, a baby in an ox's stall, the maker of the stars and sea, become a child on earth for me. It's a pretty powerful thought. He asks, is it true? Could it be that the God, the creator of all, has come to earth for me? Well, that's what Christmas is about, the incarnation of God becoming a baby. Oh, there's one more verse, and this is what he, how he closes off. He says, asked again, is it true? For if it is, if it really is true, no love that in a family dwells, no caroling in frosty air, nor all the steeples shaking bells can with this single truth compare. That God was man in Palestine and lives today in bread and wine. He said nothing can compare with it. If it's true, nothing can compare with God becoming a human being. And then he establishes the fact that God was man. He became a human being in Palestine but lives today bread and wine. As I thought about that, I thought, you know, there's a, almost a bit of a, an incarnation that takes place, right? Jesus said, this is my body. You have the bread with you. You pick it up now. He said, this is my body, and, and, which was broken for you. As we take 
this and remember that he came into this world for a purpose. He came to give us life. We take together his body broken for us. And then there's a, a cup. He took the cup and said, this, this is a, this is, he says, this is my blood shed for you. It's a new promise, a new covenant of forgiveness that comes through this blood that was shed on the cross. But when he said, this is my, my body, this is my blood, in a way, he's symbolically um, present here with us. Just as he came into the world at Christmas time, physically, we have a semblance of him, remembering his body and blood. He's present. He's present here with us. And he reminds us of his presence when he says, this is my body, this is my blood. Let's take together. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for coming into our world. You came with a purpose. You came to reveal God to us. But you also came to die on a cross. You came as a humble baby. And next time you'll come in your glory. John got a glimpse of that. You are the great I am. And we just want to worship you as the almighty God. The creator of the heavens and the earth. We also want to say thank you for loving us and thank you for giving yourself for us. And in the name of Jesus we pray, amen.
offer all your sacrifice for every sin our Savior died the Lord of life can't be contained our God has risen from the grave. Oh, our God has risen from the grave. Behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on His hands. Jesus, you Forevermore, the victory is yours. So we sing your praise, endless hallelujahs to your only name. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory. as that song sang and said there, uh, we can have the hope that Jesus reigns forevermore. Um, so as you go this week, I hope that uh, you will have that confidence, that hope with you, and know that he's always with you wherever you go to. We hope to see you Saturday night. Have a great week.